Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Guillermo Sabatier, Senior Director of uh, International Services for HSI and the host of your show here at Things Like Hawaii, uh, Perspectives on Energy. Today, we have uh, Hugh McDermott, uh, Senior VP of uh, Development and, and Sales for uh, ESS, which is uh, one of the leaders in iron flow chemistry technology. And uh, we look forward to hearing and we're excited about what he has to share. Um, I had the benefit of uh, the pleasure of actually seeing their tech um, uh, demonstrated once at one of the webinars I went to, and it was really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm really glad he was available to join us today. So, Hugh, thank you for coming. Yeah, no, pleasure to be here. Uh, really looking forward to this, uh, actually. So thank you, uh, Guillermo. Uh, well, first of all, let me uh, just sort of set the stage and, and, you know, what's the problem that we're solving and, and why we think what we're doing is important. Um, when we look at the, the grid, uh, today, uh, there's, there's three or four sort of fundamental macro trends, global trends, mega trends, you might say. We've got uh, these climate change that's happening that now, uh, where a few years ago, people were still maybe in doubt as to whether it was a real phenomenon. You know, those once in a generation, once in a century kind of climate events seem to be happening now almost annually. We've got wildfires in the West. We've got hurricanes with increasing frequency and ferocity. Uh, the second big uh, mega trend is electrification of everything, right? Right. So we're talking about displacing gas in residential homes, electrifying transportation. That's going to drive a, a massive amount of need for electrical energy around the world. And then you you look at the infrastructure that's got to carry this. And I know this uh, hits home for uh, Hawaii listeners. Mm -hmm. You've got aging infrastructure that's uh, it's, it's apparent, right? You're having outages. Uh, it can't keep up with the amount of loads and the change that's coming on the grid. And then last, you've got a renewable energy that continues to drop in cost. And now to the point where solar energy is cheaper than any fossil fired option that might be out there, or at least certainly uh, natural gas fired, which had been the kind of the go-to for new generation. So you've got uh, all these mega trends happening and it, it puts a uh, a tremendous amount of stress on the ability to deliver electrical energy to consumers and, and industries around the world. If you want to slip to the next slide, uh, just kind of illustrate that point, uh, slide five. <clears throat> um, what that does to the grid is you've basically got a ever-increasing ever challenge to deliver uh, the energy successfully. Um, you've got a, a ramp that as you put more and more renewables on the grid, um, you've got a challenge of maintaining reliability. Obviously, the sun doesn't shine at dark, the wind doesn't blow around the clock, so you need ever longer duration storage. And so mm -hmm. uh, our solution uh, to this is the iron flow battery, uh, a battery that can uh, last for, uh, provide energy over a longer period of time. And sort of our, I'll say, sweet spot of what we're trying to solve is longer than four hours and less than say a day um, to enable around the clock renewable energy to be a, a real possibility. That's basically the problem we're trying to solve. And you, what we have found, and I know this is particularly true in Hawaii, is that when you get above around 20 to 25% renewable mm -hmm. uh, generation on a grid, four hours of energy storage no longer cuts it. Right. And so if you've got, if you've got states, countries, regions, whole continents that now want to go carbon-free electric electricity by the end of the decade, in some cases, certainly by 2050 over the mid-range, uh, you can't get there without long duration energy storage. And that's that four to 24 hour kind of range. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the problem uh, we're solving and that's why we're here today. Our technology is uh, an iron flow battery chemistry. And if you want to slip, and I promise this will be my last slide, unless someone really presses me on a question. Um, the, the technology is basically, uh, the, the electrochemistry is iron saturated in salt water. And so it flows through what we call a battery module. This is a sandwich type construction. Uh, 50 layers are of a sandwich or battery module is what we make today. Uh, we'll be shifting that to a 100 layer stack uh, the second half of this year. What's happening is in that in each of those layers, we've got a carbon plate and this iron saturated salt water flows past that carbon. Each of those plates are separated by a membrane. And during the charge cycle, 
the iron is plating onto the negative side of that plate. So we're just building up a layer of iron, pure iron. And what we solved, because uh, we didn't invent this process, what we solved was a way to make that repeatable. Mm -hmm. And electrochemically, uh, it's repeatable infinitely because of the way we manage the, the electrochemistry. So essentially kind of inert the materials from mm -hmm. corrosion, from uh, degradation of any kind. And so the theory is you've got then a, a fundamental way to have a battery that you can cycle uh, unlimited number of ways at uh, times and uh, without lo losing performance with every cycle, unlike most mm -hmm. other electrochemical batteries. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't enough to make it a product. That's, right. a, that's a neat uh, uh, parlor trick, if you can show that. And this is true of every electrochemical battery is that when you're charging the battery, there's always a side set of side reactions and those side reactions affect the electrolyte and that's degradation. So loss of ability to store energy, loss of the about amount of power that you can output from that. We're no different, but what we did solve to turn this parlor trick, as I call it, into a product was an ability to continuously renew or reverse that those side reactions continuously in a closed loop fashion so that the battery can do this uh, charging and discharging unlimited times and the electrolyte never degrades and thus we have a battery that can go for literally thousands and thousands of cycles without losing performance and so that's the that's the fundamental technology and and the products that we make are trying to address both industrial and commercial type applications right. for resiliency and energy, uh, uh, reducing energy costs uh, for integrating their renewables, say solar on the roof, but also at utility scale. <clears throat> and so uh, where we're moving the company now in terms of the product development is to be able to solve large scale, right. um, deliver large scale solutions at utility, that the size that utilities and large IPPs would require them. No, that's, and that is, Great, because that, that's one of the reasons, one of the things I first saw when I first saw the, the uh, when I first saw your product on ESS on, on a webinar, it really caught my attention. And 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 specifically with, with like uh, either customers, like specifically the Hawaiian Islands, right, where they're, they have mm -hmm. these unique challenges where other places like the Canary Islands, for example, or, or mm -hmm. other islands in the Pacific, they have no issues, for example, laying down a submarine cable. Uh, you know, and then con interconnecting islands, forming a network, and you know, relying on the resources and the reliability of being interconnected. Whereas on, on an island like Hawaii, you know, they they've had their obstacles with with, uh, mm -hmm. with actually installing that. And and the other issue they're having is you know they they they're still mostly uh, the bunker C you know, diesel generated fired mm -hmm. generation, so that that poses a definite uh, problem. So so for them, however, at the same time, dealing with all this renewable and the variability again, has another impact. So these batteries are really, really be help, helpful. So next question I'm gonna have in this case, right, which is really usually a barrier of entry for either smaller utilities, munis or cooperatives is the cost. How do these compare mm -hmm. to the conventional technology of lithium based or what, what they're using now in most utility scale batteries? Sure, so for, for the applications that, we, that we're targeting to serve, which is these longer duration where either multi-cycling uh, or long duration or resiliency is really a, a chief driver, we're at par or, or cheaper than any of the other commercially available options today. Wow. You won't get that kind of life, obviously, out of lithium ion. So when you think about the repowering costs and replacement cycle, mm -hmm. and factor all those in and your up, annual upgrades to maintain the level of performance with lithium ion batteries, on that levelized cost or life cycle cost basis, we're somewhere in, in, for an eight or a 10 hour battery, we're gonna be somewhere about half the cost of a lithium ion battery wow. to own and operate over, the, over that kind of scenario. So, so what's and the so, charge? So cost, so, so cost wise, that, that would translate by our, our modeling, that would be somewhere around two to three cents per kilowatt hour of, mm. of usable energy through, uh, as a throughput from our, our batteries over a 25 year period of time. Contrast that for lithium ion, uh, even with the most aggressive sort of price assumptions where lithium might be um, throughout this decade, uh, we would see it coming in around five cents, five to six cents, somewhere in that range. Right. And, and you have a limited number of cycles, which usually with lithium. Yeah. Which usually yeah. has that impact. And I, and I worked for the, uh, 
for uh, I worked for a large integrated utility for 29 years, and 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 towards the last five years that they were trying to implement this energy storage uh, first as a pilot, and then they decided the best application at this time they could use it for was for a black star resource. Mm -hmm. So so that that was a really interesting and and, and creative use of uh, of energy storage, but but it's still using the same you know and it got relegated to that use because it's something you're hardly ever going to need. But you know when you well, go, it's a, well, it's a giant. It becomes a giant UPS. A giant UPS, basis, exactly. Right? And 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 then it becomes a generator. But then at the same time, it becomes load. You know, which is great. You know, and and so yeah. I, I I just imagine with your particular batteries. You know, this is something that you know is dispatchable every day, but exactly. it's there during an emergency as you need it, right? Especially during a blackout and restoration. Yeah. And the fact that it becomes load, right? As you're as you're bringing gener other spinning generation online. This battery becomes load, right? And then it's almost like cheating in a way because you think about it, it's it's one of the hardest things is balancing generation and load during that initial blackout restoration process. So exciting. Exactly. Yeah, well, so I mean, you you've hit on all the kind of the salient points. I I did not realize uh, you had that background in the utility sector, but you're oh, exactly I right. I mean, the uh, in terms of uh, we like to think of it as it's the great big shock absorber, right? right. That uh, for the grid and that unlike say lithium ion batteries where every cycle counts because every cycle costs you in degradation. If you get a limited number of cycles, you get one per day. Mm -hmm. You've got to rest the battery after you've done it. Um, you've got timeout periods. You've got, yep. right. You've got a lot of, you get a rule book on how you're allowed to use that. And if you go outside of those rules, you avoid the warranty or worse, you have a potential yep. calamity. Structure. In our case, we, there's no rule book. You know, so uh, use it as you see fit. That's the beauty of it, but it's also kind of the conundrum for the industry right now is they don't know how to get their head around and model that and understand uh, how to, I'll say from the commercial sector and the private sector, how do you monetize all of that value because it's not easily transactable to a utility. It's in, they, they, inherently, they want to inherently understand that, and that's why the utilities are buying them, but when you're trying to do it from a developer's perspective and mm -hmm. trying to get the full value. I'll give you an example. One of our one of our one of our customers is a utility in Southern California, mm -hmm. and they're putting in a microgrid. Um, it's it's similar to Hawaii because the microgrid is at the end of a radial line, very similar to the transmission distribution architecture sure. of of Hawaii. So kind of like an island network, where out in the end of this line is this community, and it's prone to power outages um, increasingly in the last few years because the utility will will intentionally cut the power to avoid sparking a fire during. Wow. Uh, high, windy, dry conditions. Um, so primary mission number one is when that condition uh, uh, arises, uh, they want a microgrid that can keep critical needs customers online. So a right. medical center, petrol stations, uh, one or two food um, uh, facilities that the community can still function. People, if they need to evacuate, could get out of town, that type of thing. Um, yeah. That's his primary function, but that's a function that kind of like that UPS, you almost right. hope you never have to call on. Right. So that's right. an expensive insurance policy. Uh, in our case, they chose the battery, chose us to be the battery for that project because uh, not only is it a water-based battery, so it's not going to start a fire. Right. And it's not going to blow up in a fire if it were in one of those wildfire yeah. events, God forbid. But more importantly, that uh, for the other for all 8,760 hours in a year, they can be using that battery Dispatch. to provide grid support services mm -hmm. to maintain the quality of power for those customers out at the end of that end of that line. Yeah. Um, as conditions are going to continue to uh, new renewable energy sources come on that line. And second, if they're not needing it for that, they can sell it into the open market. market. Right, exactly. Right? And so they can get two bites at the apple without ever compromising its primary mission in life, which is when I need you, be ready for that microgrid uh, uh, outage event. <clears throat> well, now there's a market for dispatch availability. So now's a third bite of the apple, mm. so to speak. So so, so uh, there's a few companies now here, you know, in the mainland where, where they're, they're coming up with a DER uh, DERM, so the mm -hmm. Distributed mm -hmm. Energy Resource Management System, and 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 right now they're all trying to come up with a good protocol to be able to do that at the residential distribution level. Mm -hmm. So 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 eventually, you know, that there, somebody has an EV in the house and some solar panels. Well, that becomes uh uh uh, uh well, somewhere I'm using for a, a pico grade, you know, where mm -hmm. they're they're going to have the ability to be dispatched or be available mm -hmm. for dispatch, right? So that that solves 
a problem for the utilities. But the other thing as well is it's it's now there they can provide voltage support, they can provide power mm -hmm. factor correction, they can provide frequency support as well. And uh, you've got these situations where like a company has a there a region has a reserve sharing group. Mm -hmm. uh, they lose a they lose a plant. Now they have to call for operating reserves. So this is a yet another resource, you know, that that can be easily dispatchable within seconds, and, and it's this responds way better than than the spinning generators at, at some point, right? I think. So it's really really enlightening to to, to see this technology developing, and uh, especially when when it's it's something uh, that's going to be within reach, right? For a lot of the utilities that have their that their economics are are different than one of these larger investor owned. You know, yeah, very well, and and, and uh, to take it one step further, you're exactly right on all those. That if you think about uh, the social compact that utilities have with their communities, right. you know, it's become an an, an issue of uh, equity and and underserved communities. So right. uh, communities that are experiencing maybe higher than uh, normal outages or mm -hmm. poor quality power, uh, you now we've got a technology. Uh, right. that's safe for people, safe for the planet, that you're not going to have um, stakeholder concerns about, is this thing going to blow up in my backyard? I don't want that battery right. uh, located next to my, uh, my, my, my children's playground. Um, that, that's, you know, so we've got a resource that helps address both the technical uh, requirements, but also kind of a, a social justice and underserved right. communities right. Uh, option. And, and that, that, that at the end, right, it has a, um, has an application uh, uh, not just for emergency management, right? But just, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's everyday applications when it comes right. to, and especially when, as we keep moving more towards these DERs and distributed energy resources, and we're moving towards this whole peer-to-peer -peer energy marketing where, where we're at some point, you know, it's, it's going to be uh, neighbors are going to be selling power to each other, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll be engaging in those transactions at the secondary bus level. At, in a distribution circuit. Now, this of course opens up this whole other challenge, and that's kind of what we're, we're looking at from our perspective, right? Which is uh, the modeling of that, the next day mm -hmm. studies, and then mm -hmm. and then directly what we're doing is the training of the dispatchers and operators, right? So you've got the operational support personnel that have to now contend with modeling these resources. And finally, I think the, the industry is at a state where they're modeling them correctly as a as a power source, a generate uh, it's a, it's a static generator. Right, so right. so they're they're producing megawatts, but then they're also producing bars and control controlling frequency, uh, depending on the equipment they're 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 operating behind, which is great, yeah. and and then now the next stage is 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 really uh, training operators uh, using the correct simulation tools to really fine tune the dispatchability, the operation, and then the emergency use of these resources. So yeah, and, and 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 you hit on a kind of you know one of our challenges in in the industry as we go to market is really helping uh, that that I'll call it the education of right. you know you, you know because the whole energy storage industry I mean it's been the holy grail for the electric utility business for a century. Right. Um, only in the last ten years did we kind of get to a point where technology was cheap enough mm. uh, and could perform well enough that we could actually start getting the first few applications out. And it started with UPS, it started with 15 right. minute, then 30 minute. And, and four or five years ago, we kind of got to about the four hour limit, which is kind of fundamentally the, the, the outer envelope, if you will, of lithium ion technology. So if you want to go longer duration, you just add more batteries and, and you derate the battery. You can get there, but it's not it, it doesn't scale economically beyond that four hour. Right. And, and so uh, in our case, adding additional capacity we're just up to at least the design uh, stage of where we are today it's just adding more liquid right. the cost of us adding liquid is pennies on the dollar comparatively speaking of so, so this this would be really exciting to i mean once you get to the point where you're 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 able to scale this down to a point to a individual residential level right and, mm -hmm. and this will just be another module that that a, that a homeowner has in their garage or in their backyard or you know or next uh, an additional wall that's right next to their meter right so it would sort of become that um, or it becomes a community resource yes. uh type of thing right, right. Uh, which which 
uh, makes a lot of sense today. I mean, the, you know, I'll, let's talk about maybe some of the drawbacks of you know our technology compared to others. I think that was one of the areas that maybe the listeners would be interested in. Us. It's, oh, it sounds too good to be true. Well, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, we, we take up a little more footprint than uh, lithium ion, probably on the order, depending on the application and how we configure, we're going to be anywhere from two to four times more space requirement. Right, that's understandable. Um, you know, and, and so it's it's a water-based battery. You can't compress water right. uh, necessarily, but we can get it down into packages that basically what we're offering today is tractor trailer sized mm-hmm. configuration. So think a, a, a trailer um, a container. A shipping that, container size. Shipping, right? I think excuse I me, shipping that. container that can that. You know, can serve anywhere from 10 to 30 homes and provide mm-hmm. some outage wow. uh, coverage for several hours, right? With the amount of energy we can put in there. So you could see community level kind of deployments and uh, or substations and kind of something else that's unique when you stop to think about the fact that it doesn't wear out, uh, at least you've got decades of use um, in that containerized format. You could put it out there for five years, let's say, and then needs change. Mm-hmm. And I want to re- and I, I want to go use it somewhere else. You would never you would never do that with a lithium ion battery. Right. 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 And so. Uh, you have that flexibility, not only in your operating, how you're going to operate your grid, but in terms of your assets and where you're going to put them and as needs change. So maybe you need additional capacity to, maybe you need to a- a- upgrade a distribution system, but that's maybe three, four, five years away because of permitting, stakeholder right. meetings, and, and so forth. Easements. <laughs> Easements, yep. Yeah. Um, but you got to have a solution now because people are adding uh, rooftop solar. It's playing havoc with the power quality on the end of that mm-hmm. line, and uh, electric cars are coming every other week and plugging in. Oh, yeah. You could stick a, you know, a battery like ours in those kind of community at the community level as part of your DER program to alleviate that stress while you're working through the easements and working through the upgrades. And then when you're there, move that battery somewhere else. Right, exactly. And, and, and uh, two points that are, that, that are funny, really, because uh, it, it's, it's, the first one is like, like, like well, we always train blackout restoration. One of the things that you worry about is the, every substation has a limit on their station batteries. Eight hours, mm-hmm. maybe is all you're gonna get, right? Mm-hmm. In, in most cases, best case scenario. If you end up with one of these like uh, devices at every substation, now you're looking at, at, at something that has a, a lot more capacity and mm-hmm. greater, greatly augments not just that station's capability, but the entire grid the, uh, for that particular region, right? Yeah. So yeah. That's one great application. And, and the other one, of course, is, uh, and it was funny because like there was an HOA meeting where I live. And one of the things they brought up, of course, was that they, they want to get on this into this market of uh, mm-hmm. distributed resources. And, and they do want they want to look at putting up some panels on the common areas and they want to do mm-hmm. a storage solution in, you know, for, for the community. I mean, but of course, for them, it's there is the potential of, of uh, selling dispatchability. So, right. so so they're they're definitely looking at it and it's it's an investment and it, it'll generate revenue at some point so that's kind of the things that they look at now when it comes to hawaii for example that's that's something that that will um bridge the gap so to speak uh between their existing resources getting away from these uh fossil fuels that that, that are really expensive right. uh, I mean, right. they're, 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 I think one of the most expensive <laughs> utilities in uh, per kilowatt hour in, in the U.S. I think that's right. Uh, from yeah. what I understand uh, of why, you know, you're, you're definitely more expensive than California, which is one of the most expensive in uh, the continental U.S. Right. They, I think they're almost at around 40 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, 38 yeah. or 40 cents yeah. a kilowatt hour. So, 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 so it's up there. And then, of course, they're always dealing with, with uh, right now, they've got supply chain issues with, with fuel because of what's happening in Ukraine. So as you can imagine, that has definitely had an impact on what they're doing. And then eventually it's going to have an impact on their electric bills. So uh, this technology could really be something that could help them get to where, they're, where, where they want to be when it comes to uh, 100% renewable goals. And I believe it's 2030 is, is, is where, they're, where they're shooting for. So this could definitely meet the mark or help them meet that mark when it comes to that. So exciting, really exciting. Yep, very yeah, very yeah, so we had a few questions in the chat here. Let's see uh, if anybody had anything else. Uh, so we, we actually pretty much answered all these questions. Lifespan, you know, for a long time. Uh, are they readily dispatchable? Some of the things we were asking about when it comes to uh, system operations, for example, from a transmission 
Yep. So, so in terms of all those functions that you were talking about, batteries having been used in the past, mm -hmm. uh, technically, fundamentally, th this a flow battery like ours can serve every single one of those functions. There's no one battery application that it cannot do. Of course, there's going to be some that it's more economically suited for, which is the longer duration, multi-cycling type of applications. But once right. it's installed, you know, once you've got a justified its base case for how you can justify that investment. Do you want to do frequency response, fast response right. type applications? It can act absolutely do those. Or voltage support, which is voltage really, support. That's one yeah. of the things that they really, yeah. really struggle. That's right. With. Right. Well, Florida has had that issue too as well. I mean, yeah. I live in Florida and I I work for the utilities in Florida and 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 they, during those milder months, yeah. they had issues with you know with the valley where it's like they 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 could not cycle units because yeah. you know you got restrictions on the emissions and number of starts on these combined cycle plants but then the other I problem see. Is, that, is that you cannot bring them back on online in time to meet your morning uh peak right so right. so so either you shut down plants to be able to meet your valley or you have somewhere to put that put that power and there are times where you, know, you can't send them any can't send that power anywhere so these batteries would also be a really useful resource if you plan them ahead correctly right when it comes to this well, and, and that's exactly right that's that morning peak as the solar comes on stream you can't throttle down your your, right. your fossil fired plants you can't go below the minimum that nuclears need to operate at right uh and so you need a big you need a big sponge to soak up all that excess generation because the load hasn't caught up with the generation and then you have the reverse in the evening as the peaks shift later later into the evening and so a battery that can do double duty uh Absolutely. is 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 really what's called for there and that again comes back to that no no limit cycling no degradation yeah, that, that is really the uh, that and that's really i think the uh, I mean, that in combination with the with a cost comparison, it's just, I think this would be a pretty good home run when it comes to uh, both utility scale batteries and and mm -hmm. when you scale them down to smaller applications, that, that this would really, really, really meet meet that need, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we think so too. <laughs> so, I mean, thank you so much for being a part of today's show. And uh, this is uh, generally, uh, your tech has generated a great deal of interest, uh, not just in think tech Hawaii, but across the industry. And I've had a chance to speak to some of my old colleagues at the different utilities in Florida. And uh, given the fact that Florida is so prone to uh, storms and disasters, you know, mm -hmm. that, that becomes a really important resource. So so that I'm, I'm sure they'll definitely be reaching out to you as well and talking more about that. And then, of course, you know, we're, we're really interested in, in helping deliver training that has to do with the application of these batteries. And we're working on that. So definitely we'll, you know, we'll be hearing more about this. Coming up sure. and, and happy to uh, come back on on uh, on stage, so to speak, and uh, updates on progress in uh, future episodes. Outstanding. So uh, we look forward to having you here again. And 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 I have a feeling we're we're gonna there's gonna be a lot more conversations about uh, ESS and how your battery solutions can help not only Hawaii but uh, mm -hmm. pretty much any utility uh, uh, around the world when it comes to these issues when dealing with these gaps in uh, renewable energies. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Well, it was a pleasure to be on the show today. Thank you for the uh, the opportunity, Guillermo. Well, real pleasure to have you, and a real pleasure to finally get to meet you face to face, uh, virtually anyway. So, hopefully, right. we'll, we'll meet you in person someday soon. So, thank you okay. so much, everybody. All right. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.